newest permanent exhibit exhibition called New England Forest. And if you haven't had the opportunity to go up and look at it, uh, you really should make sure and do that. It's quite spectacular. And you get a, you know, it's a, it's an interactive exhibit. And so you come away with a real feeling for uh, our, our native uh, forest here in New England. Um, it opened last September and provides a great overview to the ecology of New England forests, complete with videos and graphics. And uh, they feature a number of Harvard faculty in their research program on a variety of issues, such as climate change, invasive species, and deforestation. The other talks in the forest series and all of the museum's public lectures can be found uh, online and on the materials over on the table to the right. Uh, the museum would love to keep you informed about all of their wonderful programs and events and exhibits. Then the best way to do that is either to join the museum, uh, become a member, or sign up for their e-newsletter. And also, there's uh, information about the place where I work, the Arnold Arboretum, and the Harvard Forest uh, in Petersand, Massachusetts. And uh, just, uh, I should note that I forgot to introduce myself, uh, and my name is Peter Daltredici. Uh, I am the senior research scientist at the Arnold Arboretum. So, uh, as I just mentioned, information about not only the museum, but the Harvard Forest and the Arnold Arboretum, Harvard's three premier botanical institutions are all located on the table over there. Uh, contributions and guidance with the exhibit, and tonight, um, we're going to hear more from David Foster, as well as his colleague David Orwig, um, as they talk about how invasive species are reshaping the forests of New England. Now, uh, it's my distinct privilege and honor to introduce David Foster, uh, the director of the Harvard Forest. If you're not familiar with the Harvard Forest, it's a 3,000 plus acre research facility located in Peter Sam, Massachusetts, about 60 miles west of uh, Boston. It's a great place to visit any time of the year, uh, but particularly uh, as the fall season approaches. It just goes straight out Route 2, and uh, as if the forest weren't enough to sort of draw you out there, uh, they also have a wonderful uh, forest history museum exhibit that I really encourage you uh, to see. It was constructed during the 1930s and it's a really a beautiful uh, piece of work. David um, is the author of several books and publications. Most recently he co-authored a very important report on New England's forest and landscape uh, called Challenges and Choices. Uh, he is a, uh, if not the leading voice, for uh, promoting the conservation of New England forests. And on a personal note, uh, he's also the author of, uh, the principal author, I should say, of the Wildlands and Woodlands uh, Strategy for Conserving uh, New England Forests on a, a regional scale. And this uh, proposal, this program that he's put together has really taken off and has uh, had a major impact in terms of how people think about conservation issues as they, uh, you know, as we move into the future. David, uh, I've known David for a long time. He's been director of the Harvard Forest for almost 20 years, and um, it's a very long time, and I've known him for most of that time, and one of the things I want to say to David that makes David unique is when he took over the Harvard Forest, it was sort of in a transition period between being a Harvard sort of botanical research station and being uh, a, a very limited in its scope, essentially focusing on sort of the Harvard community. And he managed to essentially, over the period of his tenure, transform the Harvard Forest into an international ecological research station. And not only focusing on the forests of Peter Sam, Massachusetts, and all of the details that go into understanding forest dynamics, but also then tie that information into the larger, not only regional picture, but the global picture, such that uh, people all over the world, conservationists all over the world, now recognize the Harvard Forest as one of the premier uh, locations for uh, doing ecological work in a modern context. So with that introduction, let me introduce David Foster.
Well, thanks very much to Peter, and thank you all for, for coming. What Dave Org and I would like to do tonight is really to um, cover um, as broadly as we can the many facets of in spa invasive species. In this particular talk, we're going to focus primarily on those species of insects and pathogens which are damaging and deleterious to trees and to forests, as opposed to focusing on one of the topics that Peter Del Tredici is a true master on, which is invasive plants in the forest. But as this slide alludes to the fact um, invasive species, invasive pests and pathogens, insects and diseases are multifaceted. And they're, of course, also of pronounced importance to our forests. But covering them in a talk, we need to come from an understanding of individual species like the Asian longhorn beetle that's in the center there and understand its biology and how they operate. We need to understand their impact on the forest as shown by this um, nearly completely dead oak forest here on the far right. And then importantly, we need to give a lot of consideration to the way that people interact with both the pests and the impacts that they generate. And so we'll try to cover all those topics um, here tonight. Now last year I gave a talk on kind of the history and future of forests of New England. And at one point I showed this photograph or a series of photographs which come from the island of Martha's Vineyard. Um, the top picture, which hopefully you can make out better than I can from where I'm standing, shows in the front a green row of trees and in the background a skyline in which every tree essentially is dead across the top. And then down below there are details, a close-up of that dead forest on the left and then the individual trees on the right. And because I was covering the whole scope of, of forest history and the future of the New England landscape, including its conservation, I just alluded to this type of process that we're gonna focus on tonight as being one of the most important things that's happening in our forest landscape across North America today. And it's one that we believe will become increasingly important, both as insects continue and diseases continue to arrive here, brought by people, and as insects both arriving and ones that are native to the region start interacting with the environmental changes that are coming to our landscape. And so tonight what we'd like to do is to explore these processes um, as broadly as we can and to leave you with some suggestions for how we can think about them operating in our landscape today and what to a certain extent and to as great extent as possible we can do to address them. Now as Peter Del Tredici alluded to, um, we're very much coming from um, the Harvard Forest and the ecological research that we do there. Um, most of what we present today is research that has been initiated by people at the forest, takes place all across New England, but it's very much a part of a series of different research programs that we um, have going. And then we are very much a part of Harvard University, so in addition to the research that we do, we have a very strong educational program, and one of the unique features of that educational program is that every summer we employ somewhere between 30 and 40 undergraduate students to be part of our research effort. These students come from Harvard, but they also come from other institutions of, uh, across the United States and indeed internationally. And so everything that we talk about tonight is very much a kind of joint effort of a large number of scientists and a very active and energetic group of, of students. That's very important to understand the perspective that we come at issues like um, ecosystems or forests in New England and the things that are affecting them. The research at the Harvard Forest, it's an institution that was founded in 1907, but even in 1907, the first director of the Harvard Forest recognized something that we hold very true today, and that is in order to understand the modern condition of our landscape, the modern condition of our environment, and the future of it, 
One needs to have a very intimate understanding of its past, of its history, going back hundreds of years or in many cases thousands of years. And so what this graphic represents is the fact that there's a constant interplay between our understanding of what's happening today, our speculations and best judgments about what might happen in the, in the future, and our grounding of all that in an understanding of how we got here today and what has happened to our forests in the past. Part of that research involves working with groups across North America to try to project out where our land is going in the future. And so the work that we do in ter terms of invasive species and their impacts is very much part of understanding how that operates today and how it might interact with, say, future changes that people bring to the land and future changes that climate brings to the land. And these graphics up here represent the fact that in different parts of the United States and in North America, you need to be aware of different processes, but that in almost every case, there's a very strong interaction with what people are doing. So let me start and kind of paint the, uh, prepare the stage and paint the, the background to this talk, which Dave Orwig will then follow up on, by talking a little bit about the long-term history of our forests and what we know about the historical role of invasive species or species that go into such a um, growth phase that they end up having a major and deleterious impact on our forests. The first and most important thing to understand is that our forests do have a lengthy history in much of northern North America, that's a history that goes back 10 to 20,000 years, most recently since the last ice age. And one of the things that we do at the Harvard Forest is to study that history by taking cores of lakes and wetlands and to reconstruct the dynamics of vegetation. And there are a couple of really important characteristics that emerge and ecological lessons that emerge from that kind of historical work. I'm not going to paint the details of alpine or tundra vegetation being replaced by boreal vegetation and so on that, that many of you have heard. But if we look at that long span of time, the first take home message is that on the long term, our forests are very dynamic. That is in 20,000 years, they have gone from tundra and boreal forest to the kind of modern forest that we have today. But 20,000 years is a very long time. And so it actually turns out that most of that change is very slow and incremental. It's changes in populations and changes in characteristics of the landscape that are changing in accordance with climate change. And in most cases, climate change is occurring relatively slowly. The human imprint on the land in Eastern North America and in New England especially, before the arrival of European people was extraordinarily modest. And so we don't actually see any direct evidence in any of the vegetation reconstructions that we do of people. But we do see lots of natural processes like climate change. In that entire record, there is one really distinctive period which is shown here, which is known kind of broadly as the hemlock decline. And it occurred 5,000 years ago in which, at which point all across the range of eastern hemlock, there was a catastrophic decline of 90 to 95 or more percent of the populations. It happened essentially instantaneously in the kinds of records that we look at. And interestingly enough, it was paralleled in Europe by a decline in elm. And as I'll show momentarily, it was paralleled by declines in some other species here in eastern North America. So for the longest time, this was interpreted originally as a climate impact. But as the records improved and the catastrophic nature increased, it became thought of very much as something extraordinary and beyond climate, because hemlock in New England was one of the only species that was responding. And so then, a the, uh, hypothesis was generated that this was actually triggered by the outbreak of an insect or some other type of pathogen operating in the landscape. In recent years, people have found lots and lots of insect remains associated with this. And so this stands as the single known example 
up until a couple of years ago, of an insect outbreak or a pathogen outbreak causing a catastrophic decline of, of a species. Now, in the last five years or so, we've looked, we've scoured the New England landscape and we've come up with one other very interesting anomalous case that actually matches hemlock perfectly. And that's shown here in which we have overlain for hemlock from central and northern and western New England. That record of oak, which comes from the base of Cape Cod, Martha's Vineyard, and Nantucket. And you can see that there was a completely parallel and quite analogous decline in oak populations in the southeastern part of Massachusetts and in that coastal region and in hemlock across the region. We've also done a lot of climate reconstructions and it's very clear that that was a tumultuous period of very warm climates and very, very severe droughts. Now, there are still all these insect remains. And so we think now, although we're still tr looking for additional evidence on this, we think that this is actually a wonderful case, although catastrophic if you were in the landscape at the time, a wonderful case of the interaction between a biotic agent, insects, and climate change leading to a great population growth in this insect and a catastrophic decline in a species that this insect operated on. Now, because it's happening in two spe different species of trees, it's undoubtedly two different species of insects. We know what one of the insects was that affects hemlock, and we're searching now, as recently as this past summer, taking samples to try to find this insect in, in um, Cape Cod and, and Martha's Vineyard on oak trees. So the take-home lesson from the deep history of the New England landscape, and in fact worldwide, is that yes, there have been catastrophic declines or episodes of mortality in major tree species, but they're extraordinarily rare, and they happen at a time when there are major shifts in the environment. It's important to take that and put that into the context of what Dave is going to talk about, because he's going to talk about a whole succession of species which have or are or are about to go into major outbreak mode and affect our tree species today. And important to recognize that today we're also in a period of very tumultuous climate and environmental change, which is going to interact both with those new species and with species that are already here and native. So there's much that we can learn uh, from the deep past that provides some analogies for what's happening to us today. And there's also much that shows us that we're in a very, very distinctive period. So I'd like to now shift and introduce Dave Orwig. I'd like to do it using this slide for two reasons. Dave Orwig came to the Harvard Forest or to Harvard University in 1995 when I recognized that the hemlock woolly adelgid was in New England and would most likely become a major factor in influencing our hemlock populations, maybe potentially eradicating hemlock really as a dominant tree across the entire region and maybe even the entire range of, of hemlock. I thought it was very important that we study those ecosystems. It was very important that we study that insect in this phenomenon. And interestingly, there was no research program that was looking ecologically as at this as a process. There's lots of money going into trying to combat the insect, nothing going <coughs> into actually analyzing what happens when an insect spreads through the range of a species that it feasts on and causes that species to decline. And hemlock is unfortunately a remarkably good species to study this with because it's such a dominant species where it grows. It so strongly controls its environment that when it does disappear, there are catastrophic shifts or major shifts in the ecosystem and the landscape. And what I put up here is a slide which captures some of the material that's going into a book that we're putting together on hemlock as a species, on its prehistory and its current situation. And it's a book that Dave is very actively involved in, in writing chapters for. So Dave Orwood came here in 1995. He has an undergraduate degree from 
Rensselaer Institute of Technology, a PhD from Penn State University. He's one of the foremost authorities on old growth forests in the eastern United States. He, since 95, has focused on the topic he's going to talk about tonight, which is the way that um, a variety of, of invasive species transform our forested landscape. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, David, for setting the stage for this, and it's my pleasure to be here tonight. And I hope to move us forward from that history that David so well set up and move us into the present, or uh, just a very recent past. And to do that, I thought I'd say just a few words about the resource that's being affected, and that's the New England Forest, which of course, uh, as many of you know, is a very large landmass. It's 33 million acres of forest, and this represents a very significant and productive forest, um, certainly acts as a, a global carbon sink, and as David points out, it's extremely dynamic. And some of those dynamics are what I hope to focus on today, particularly looking at the impacts of invasive pests or insects, how do we deal with that from a management perspective, and hopefully leave you with some um, take home messages. Now these 33 million acres in New England are part of even a, la a larger uh, land base, stemming up the Appalachians all the way in into Canada. And our New England landscape, as many of you know, is comprised of a variety of different tree species, mostly uh, oak hickory in the southern part of New England, transitioning into a white pine hemlock, northern hardwoods as you go further north and then into um, spruce fir. So the fact, uh, the left-hand slide shows that the current landscape is comprised of at least 60% tree cover throughout most of New England is really a testament uh, because it, that landscape changed so dramatically uh, in the last couple hundred years. And you may have seen this graph before, but this is a graph showing the percent of forest cover and how that's changed in the New England states over time. And you can see um, the y-axis is just percent forest cover. If we start at 1600, just prior to European settlement, we can see that the vast majority of New England forests were heavily forested, upwards of almost 90% forest cover. And uh, the black uh, line that uh, continues to increase here is the human population. So as human population increased, of course, so did their imp uh, influence on the landscape, so much so that uh, by the mid-1800s, you know, some states had lost uh, upwards of, you know, 60 or 70 percent more of the forest cover down to only 30 percent forest cover. So it was a much more open landscape uh, than we have um, today. And then many of those farms and uh, pastures were abandoned. The area showed uh, remarkable resiliency and it became much more reforested, um, so much so that, again, we're back up to this 80%. But of course, we have this continuing population increase and these two trends can't continue forever. And we do start seeing in the 1970s that all New England states have started to lose forest cover again, mostly due to development. So in the background, why this, um, you know, anthropogenic change was occurring. We also had um, sometimes infrequent but large impact storms, including ice storms, uh, wind storms, hurricanes, uh, which left major uh, biological legacies in our forests um, in the form of either large um, tip-up mounds that you can see here or large uh, wind-thrown trees and snags, many of which are currently missing from our, our second growth forest today. Now another um, major influence, as David set up, is the fact that we started having the advent of uh, invasive pests from elsewhere started to arrive in, in North America, particularly in New England. Now historical records would suggest that prior to 1850, there may have been a dozen or so species that came from elsewhere that at least had some damage to trees uh, in North America. However, following 1850, as population increased, as did the means to transport things, also became much more efficient and more global, we see a, a huge increase in the in amount of uh, invasive pests that came in uh, to our shores. And of course, this is a, a very dominant component of global change, the estimates of which are really hard to, to uh, document. Four billion annually is probably an underestimation depending on how you characterize uh, dealing with invasive pests. And of course, many of the pests uh, do arrive into our shores by a variety of different ways, either by transported plants and seeds with the horticultural industry, or in uh, hidden in um, pallets and wooden uh, packing material as larvae that then come out and escape out into our forests. Um, additionally, some species have arrived here on uh, lumber that was imported. 
or sometimes accidentally, like our friend here, the gypsy moth, was introduced here into Massachusetts with the idea that it would help the silk industry, but of course, it then escaped and has been a, a, um, an influence in our force ever since, uh, the mid, mid to late 1800s. So um, a few uh, of the prominent uh, fungal pests that have arrived on our shores uh, includes the chestnut blight. Chestnut in various portions of the New England land landscape was a dominant species. You see a nice picture on the left. Uh, it's now relegated to an understory tree or shrub in many of our forests. So it wasn't totally eliminated for our, from our forests, but functionally it's been eliminated as a large tree. Now you do see an occasional large tree here and there, but basically functionally it has been eliminated as a large tree due to the uh, introduced um, chestnut blight. Similarly, uh, our grand American elms, which so dominated some of our uh, uh, pastoral landscapes, have now been removed by another uh, fungal blight, actually from Asia, but because all the research was done in the Netherlands, always has the term the Dutch elm disease. But that also had a huge influence, not only on pastoral landscapes, but also in urban and suburban areas where elm trees were planted along many streets. And of course, many towns have elm streets that uh, stem back into that time. Of course, most elm streets have no longer any elms in them. But this is a nice old photo from the Arboretum from near Boston Common in the late 1800s. So that brings us up to today. And um, in many ways, New England forests are uh, a really valuable resource to study because they literally contain the, the who's who of invasive species that are influencing forests. Uh, with the exception of uh, sudden oak death on there, almost all of these pests at some point have influenced our New England forests. And each one of these, I, I could devote a lecture or two or an hour or two to describe them. And of course, I don't have that type of time tonight. So I thought I'd focus on a few of the dominant species that are influencing our landscape or are poised um, to do so. And I'm going to start with hemlock woolly delta just because that's kind of in my wheelhouse. I've been studying it for 18 years or so. And this is a really small insect pest that is influencing our uh, eastern hemlock. It's less than a millimeter in size. And despite that small size, it, it can have tremendous influence on and impact on forests. And this is due largely to its life history traits. In particular, the, the top two there, they have two generations a year, um, so they can reproduce uh, multiple times a year. And every individual in North America is an obligate female due to parthenogenetic uh, life history traits. So you only need one of these individuals to survive and lay eggs to lead on to the next generation. And so this is a recipe for success for this invasive uh, pest in our forest. Now, because of its small size, it can be rapidly dispersed uh, through uh, birds' wings, air, humans, vehicles. It does very well at getting around the landscape. And unlike some pests, this particular pest can feed on and kill all sizes and age classes, from the smallest seedling to the largest and oldest uh, old growth tree. Now, it's been in the eastern United States since the 1950s and in New England since the 1980s. And in that time, we've not really seen much evidence for any hemlock resistance, although the search is on to look for some areas that were heavily damaged that may still have live trees to look for um, hemlock resistance. And of course, being from uh, another country, um, we really have no native predators that are influential enough to uh, keep this population in check. And just real briefly, this is not a defoliator per se, and it might be hard to see here, but this uh, insect has a long feeding tube or stylet, and so it doesn't really chew on needles. It inserts a stylet at the twig at the base of the needle and draws on reserves from the branch. And you can see these on the underside of a hemlock branch. If you turn over the branch, you can see a lot of these woolly tufts. Each woolly tuft has an adult and eggs developing in them. And this slide also shows its current range and it's not just in New England. All New England states have it, but it stems all the way down to Georgia. Um, it's not yet in Canada. Of course, there is hemlock in Canada, uh, but, but no adelgid yet. And you can see Massachusetts is completely colored in. That's a little of an exaggeration because it's county-based. This is the only state that actually has town-by-town town records, so it gives us some sense of how it's spread. And there's a lot of colors on here, but it basically, basically was found in Springfield, uh, Massachusetts and then worked its way up the Connecticut River Valley and also worked its way along the warmer um, coastal forest. Um, basically, cold temperatures are the really true only controlling factor. It needs to get well below zero Fahrenheit to have any type of population control. And if you think about last winter, it was so warm. This uh, insect is really 
literally blown up. It is really reproducing well, it's spreading. We're seeing it in towns uh, that aren't even on, uh, lit up here on this map. So it's really uh, having very good growth conditions right now. And just uh, in terms of what happens when it reaches a forest, even though they can experience population fluctuations from year to year, um, basically once it's in a forest, they're there. They're gonna have chronic feeding effects on these trees. And so what happens is the tree starts to lose needles and thin, and sometimes you just have needles at the edges of the branches and at the top of the tree. What would normally be a tree that was hard to see through, now you can see right through these once they've been infested for some period of time. And basically it takes anywhere from four to 15 years to die, depending on the location. New England's a little bit better because we do at least occasionally get some cold weather. Trees last a little bit longer up here once infested, unlike down south. Now what we've seen is a pretty dramatic change in cover type that will occur once hemlock starts to even just decline before they die. Black birch, a deciduous hardwood tree, is really the dominant replacement species. And I've seen that everywhere from the mid-Atlantic all the way up into Maine in infested hemlock forests. Black birch commonly grows in hemlock forests. It sets seed every year. It's a very good species capable of uh, coming and following hemlock. And here's a site where hemlock's been dead for about 20 years and black birch is the dominant tree so far in that forest. And uh, because hemlock has such strong control over the microenvironment, it's a very deep shaded conifer, it's shade tolerant. Um, it can influence not only the microenvironment but, but nitrogen cycling and other ecosystem functions and wildlife habitat. So if you lose a species like this, it has tremendous cascading effects on other parts of the ecosystem, including the structure function, of course, but also on wildlife habitat and hydrology as hemlock grows commonly along streams and, and riparian areas. And I will point out this is actually a view from the southern uh, Appalachians. This entire hillside was killed off in just a few years. Okay, the, the next uh, insect I thought I'd introduce you to, you probably heard a lot about in the news, is the Asian longhorn beetle. This is again originally from China and Korea and other parts of Asia. Uh, was first found outside of its native range in the mid-1990s here in North America. Now in its native range, it's really not that much of a pest till recently when millions of hectares of, of uh, poplar and other species were planted for reforestation and or windbreaks. And so that probably led the way to an increase in those um, insects that were then transported to North America. They're a very large insect here. We can see a male guarding a female as she chews a uh, oviposition site so that's the good news that they're big because you can actually see evidence of them when they're around on trees. Um, and then when they develop, they come out in these very large exit holes, which I'll show you here. And the major issue with this insect is that it has a variety of trees it likes to feed on. Over 20 different hardwood species it can feed on and develop and grow out of. And so um, it's de definitely a generalist feeder, including species like maple and elm and uh, aspen and willow and things of that nature. So it's important, unlike the woolly dodger, which is firmly entrenched across the landscape, as it stands right now, the Asian longhorn beetle is, is relegated to literally isolated populations, mostly in urban areas. And it was first seen in Brooklyn, New York in 1996, and then out in Illinois. Uh, in, incidentally, the, the outbreak in Illinois has now been since declared eradicated. So you can eliminate this species if you're proactive with it. Um, of course, in, in our state of Massachusetts, it was seen in Worcester in 2008 and more close by here in Boston in 2010. I'll give you a few of those details in, in just a minute. Some of you may not have heard or may not know, but there's another infestation now in Ohio that was found last summer. It's now growing. There's over 5,000 trees infested out there. That's a little bit different because it's actually more of an agricultural landscape with woodlots. So the, the, the method that this beetle can influence trees with is the fact that, again, it's a large beetle, it lays eggs, and so then it, those develop into larvae, which, while they're rapidly growing, they stay in the outer part of the tree in that um, cambium and phloem area. But then as the larvae develops, they, they go back into the heart of the tree of the hardwood. Um, and so um, over time, this can certainly provide structural integrity issues with the tree. And I've literally seen trees with hundreds of holes in them. And so they certainly had multiple generations, multiple years probably of egg laying and larval development. And so once those larvae are in the tree for a year or two, they, they chew their way out in these very large, um, very circular holes that they come out of. Um, however, if you remember, I told you they stay in the hardwood a lot. So this actually 
um, allows the tree to survive much longer than other insects that stay on the outside of the tree because um, even though this tree has hundreds of holes or dozens of holes, this was that same tree's crown. And while it doesn't look great, it didn't die yet. Now, I certainly would predict that this tree would die eventually, but it's, it's not a very rapid process. Trees can survive for several years um, with the advent of uh, Asian longhorn beetle. And just a few facts on the, on the two Massachusetts uh, outbreaks. Again, a concerned resident found it in 2008 in Worcester, and then APHIS came in and set up a quarantine to try to prevent any movement of woody material, which now consists of a 110 square mile quarantine area centered around Worcester, Mass which includes the town of Shrewsbury and West Boylston in, in particular. And this um, required a lot of uh, people power to search all host trees. You can imagine in a forested landscape and in a large city searching all host trees. That effort has now um, included well over two, two million trees checked for the beetle itself. Over um, 21,000 trees have been found infested, which makes it the largest infestation in North America. Um, not to mention the fact that over 30,000 trees have been removed, which certainly changes landscapes and neighborhoods and the appearance of these neighborhoods. It's the same view before and after uh, the trees are removed. Now this is in contrast to the Boston situation. Faulkner Hospital right across from the Arnold, Arnold Arboretum, um, they found uh, Asian longhorn beetle there, but only six trees were infested, six trees were removed, and that remains uh, what, how many trees that were removed. So I always hold this up as kind of like the poster child for early detection. Fortunately, it was found early. It hadn't spread, it hadn't developed and, and flown off and, and onto other trees. And so six trees versus, you know, 30,000 trees in Worcester. And just to point out that um, in, in many of the cases, as I told you, a, ALB is mostly a, an, an urban pest. But for the first time in Worcester, it escaped over into more uh, what I would call natural forest, closed canopy forest situations. This map shows uh, one of those, or two of those little tracts of land. One's called the Bavenzi Conservation Area, and there's a, uh, a little stand north of there too in West Boylston. So this is the first time in North America that it actually infested forests. We get some idea of what do they prefer, how do they disperse, what type of Im impacts do they have. And just a few brief uh, comments on these areas. The Bavenzi area is the uh, slide on the right. It was mostly a, a, you know, a second growth red maple, hickory, oak forest which had trees of various sizes, may up, maybe up to 60 centimeters. And Asian longhorn beetle in that forest was relegated to just red maple trees. In that particular forest, about a third of the trees had um, Asian longhorn beetle in them in a variety of age classes, not just small, not just large, but throughout the, the size class. Um, just further north in, in West Boylston, it was a, a larger, more mature uh, maple forest, which had both sugar maple, Norway maple, and red maple, as well as birch and elm species, all potential hosts for this um, insect. And in this particular case, um, it preferred red maple, but it did influence both sugar maple and Norway maple, but it not only preferred red maple, it actually developed better in red maple over the other maple species. Again, since we didn't know how it would actually behave once it got to a forest, there was some thought that maybe it was considered a quote unquote lazy insect, doesn't fly much, it'll stay around. And we saw that it actually did, after several years of infestation, it was able to migrate out into forests, close canopy forests. And if you look at a topographic map, I mean, there's just continuous forest from Worcester on north. So it's very important that they try to contain this insect because it will continue to, to travel into more continuous forests, which is much harder to search. Um, in, in forested situations, uh, we did not see ALB attack birch or elm, even though they are potential hosts. That's not to say they would not eventually be attacked, but they certainly weren't over the first 10 years or so of infestation. Okay, uh, certainly one of the really kind of troubling pests that we have throughout, you know, the eastern United States, I'd say, is this emerald ash borer. Uh, this insect was uh, native to, again, China, Korea, uh, Japan, and Taiwan, and it was only discovered 10 years ago in, in southeast Michigan, and it was believed to have entered again on woody packing material probably as a larva contained in that, and then it crawled its way out, and then formed more eggs and kept going. And again, this, this insect uh, lays eggs that larva will then feed on just the outermost portion of the tree. And of course, this is much more damaging than if it was in the heartwood. And so in a very short period of time, trees die off from this insect pest. And this focuses primarily on just ash species, uh, white, green, and black ash. 
Uh, you can see by the size of the penny here, obviously it's a much smaller insect than the Asian longhorn beetle, but it's a very good flyer. Uh, it has a characteristic D-shaped uh, exit hole when, it, when the larvae crawl out of it. And oftentimes it can be found uh, in stressed ash trees. Uh, once infested, they may form these epicormic shoots, which they, which they don't normally do. And if you haven't heard, it was actually confirmed last week that it was officially um, um, confirmed that it was in Massachusetts now. It's in southwestern Mass. Um, it's also in um, northwest or uh, southern Connecticut as well. So it's, it's working its way east and, in my opinion, will continue to do so because it is so widespread across the landscape. Again, unlike the Asian longhorn beetle, which just has isolated populations, uh, Asian, or excuse me, emerald ash borer is, in my opinion, out of control. In 10 years, it's now gone into 18 different states, mostly by flying, but also through uh, movement of woody uh, material, mostly firewood and things of that nature. So that's a tremendous spread in 10 years, and it's unlikely it'll stop or slow down. And of course, uh, we have very good information where this insect is by, you may have seen these a lot yourself, these uh, what they're called purple prism traps that you see probably hanging all over the place. And certainly out in central mass and western mass, we see them all over. They're large purple traps that eight, uh, emerald ash borers seem to be attracted to. And again, in just a short period of time, it's already killed tens of millions of ash trees, primarily in the Midwest. It certainly is a major threat to eight billion trees. Uh, even got its own kind of centerfold spread in Time Magazine, The Bug That Ate North America. If you've seen that last summer, it was very impressive. Um, but this will cause probably unprecedented financial loss, at least to the ash uh, industry. And much like the elm picture I showed you before, we see these ash-lined tr um, streets that were then literally wiped out uh, by this emerald ash borer. And it's kind of is a recurring theme in terms of, you know, Certainly for urban, suburban areas, a diversity of species is critical if you're gonna have a replanting effort. Otherwise, you're just setting it up for the next pest that, that comes by and likes a uh, particular species of trees. Um, the last insect I'll, I'll introduce you to tonight is, is the winter moth. This is not nearly as widespread as the other insects, but certainly has the potential to be so and is increasing quite a bit in the state of Massachusetts. And this is a, an introduced bu uh, insect from, uh, from Europe, a moth. Um, and it gets its name from the fact that the male moths will oftentimes really swarm on uh, trees in you know, late fall, early winter, like this picture on the left suggests. Um, so the way this manifests is that the females will lay eggs in little tiny bark crevices, uh, very small eggs. And then those eggs hatch out and form little caterpillars, which will then um, literally crawl to the edge of the branches of hardwood trees. And they'll start the feeding in the bud before it actually leafs out. And so that can cause tremendous damage in the bud and to the developing leaves, such that if they're lucky enough to be able to unfurl and uh, fully leaf out, you're left with this situation. And in some cases, you get comp complete or entire defoliation. And so the other problem, again, is that it's a generalist feeder now. It, it likes all types of hardwoods from maples and oak and apple, even down to a blueberry. So that's why I, I thought I'd mention this species. And if we look at its spread, this is a, a, a map showing the damage in Massachusetts from 2011 from aerial detection surveys. And you can see it's largely a north coast, uh, you know, south shore, down to the coastal islands phenomenon so far. Um, in 2011, this represented about 88,000 acres, which only two years prior, it only impacted 15,000 acres. So it certainly seems to continue to spread. It was actually found as far west as Athol which is out where David and I uh, work out near Peter Sam. So it certainly has the ability to probably continue to migrate west. You know, so, so, so what do we do with all this? We have, um, I've only introduced a few here, but we have a multitude of pests that are shaping our forests. Are there things that we can do, at least on a local level? And of course, there are uh, a multitude of options. And I'm gonna introduce three of the major options that we have. The first is biological control. And I'm not going to go into every scenario for every insect, but provide a few examples of this. Certainly for the hemlock woolly adelgid, biological control has been a, a very large effort, multi-year, multi-agency effort to try to combat the woolly adelgid. And the beetle on the left um, was introduced, um, brought in from Japan where it was feeding on woolly adelgid in Japan and has been released on over 100 sites in 15 eastern states. 
And the problem with this particular beetle, in, in my opinion, is that just reproductively, it can't keep up with that double um, generations per year of adelgid. And basically, it's just not been very effective at maintaining low adelgid populations. Now, adelgid also occurs in the, in the Pacific Northwest on western hemlock. And, um, but it doesn't kill the trees out there. The trees have some resistance, and they have some pests. So this western lacewing, Laracobius, uh, seems to be a, a good candidate for biocontrol. Uh, you know, certainly it's from North America. It feeds on adelgid. And so they've been releasing that uh, in many eastern states. And this holds some promise in the fact that it does overwinter. It reproduces. You can find it again. And with one release, you can get multiple generations that follow. And so you have to at least have that uh, if you want some chance for future success. And so I would say it's still too early to say if this um, particular biocontrol will work or not, but at least has some characteristics that may, may provide uh, some success later on. In terms of emerald ash borer, the large effort with that pest because of the larva in the tree is to look for parasitoids or parasitic insects that would lay eggs uh, in the bark or near the larva so that they could then parasitize that larva. Um, I mentioned woodpeckers, and while they're not biocontrol agents per se, in some of those heavily infested areas, woodpeckers, you know, you can find your food, and you can find a lot of food in heavily infested areas, and so they have made some dent, but they're not going to be the long-term solution, of course. And then just lastly, winter moth, uh, there was a parasitic insect that was um, found in New, New Brunswick and in Canada where a winter moth had been, and was very successful at eradicating or at least reducing it uh, in, in numbers. And so that's a major effort now to try to release it into these coastal areas that I showed to try to look for some success later. And of course, the vast majority of at least homeowners and managers, uh, they don't all have access to biocontrol, but many people have access to at least some form of, of chemical control. And this has uh, proven to be quite effective in most of these pest examples, at least on a tree by tree basis. So you can indeed protect trees. Um, with the exception of ALB, you, you can't really prevent ALB, but you can prevent uh, the adults from chewing on the leaves by at least treating some maples with this uh, systemic chemical. And the chemical of choice really is uh, imidacloprid. That's a systemic chemical that the tree takes up and the feeding larva, or um, in the, the case of uh, woolly adelgid, feed on and die. And usually give you multiple years of protection. And so that's used on a variety of insects and even um, golf courses. <laughs> But for, in terms of forest pests, it's really good for uh, hemlock woolly adelgid and EAB. And a few other chemicals that I show here, some can be applied right to the tree trunk. Um, and that's very effective uh, for um, you know, specimen trees as well. And then lastly, in terms of uh, chemical, there are some bacterial and fungal, fungally derived products that exist uh, that can provide really good protection, sp specifically for uh, emerald ash borer. This, uh, emamectin benzoate is really effective uh, treatment, and that's a soil fungus uh, derived product. And of course, you can always kind of go old school and pr produce barriers. Like when I was a kid, we always had these burlap, you know, rings around trees to prevent caterpillars from growing up and you know, climbing up into the tree. And now you have more sophisticated barriers, but it's the same concept. You prevent them um, from growing, you know, climbing up the tree and getting to the buds. And some of them have really sticky substances on them now, and so that can be used as well. Um, occasionally, you know, we still have uh, very common, uh, frequent spraying of soaps and oils. That they're cheap. You can get good coverage on certain trees. In this case, it's hemlock trees being uh, sp uh, sprayed with a chemical. And at certain times of the year, it's, this is good. You can actually suffocate those insects. But it's really hard to get full treatment and coverage. You can imagine in this particular example here, um, you know, they're never going to reach the top of that tree with this. But we just happened to see it when we were out. And so it does occur. It's very useful on smaller trees, ornamental trees in your yard. Uh, but it does need to be repeated because the adelgid keeps uh, reproducing. And of course, any time you have a, an outbreak of a pest or disturbance that leads to tree decline and, and mortality, um, you always see an increase typically in cutting of those species. And um, certainly that's common. We, we continue to see that. But uh, you know, our view certainly is that you know, the widespread removal of host trees, uh, particularly before they're infested or if they're nearby, just isn't warranted whatsoever. Uh, you don't have to cut your trees if they're being threatened by an insect. Certainly if you want to, uh, no problem under the, under the right circumstances, no issues whatsoever. Um, 
But if you do that, if you remove all these trees, you could be removing potentially resistant individuals. And um, uh, in many cases, um, that cutting could lead to more dramatic responses than just letting the trees die in place. I mentioned here cutting barriers. That's sometimes raised as, a, as an idea. Well, let's cut three miles of hemlock um, so that there's no host trees for that insect to get to. And quite honestly, that just doesn't work. Uh, these insects can, can get moved around just too well. And so now you're cutting off all this resource and it just has no chance for success in my opinion. Um, occasionally you also hear about um, using silviculture or forest management to perhaps get a different type of uh, resistant forest to either uh, disturbance or insects. And in some cases that does work. In certain examples with spruce budworm, you can create a certain type of forest structure that may make it less susceptible to outbreaks. But in other cases, I can show you that that same approach led to even greater uh, defoliation events. So um, I'd say that's mixed success. And so um, with, with the example of Asian longhorn beetle, you don't really have a choice. It's a federally quarantined species. Aphis comes in, sets up the quarantine, and basically, because they're still in isolated populations, because they grow and develop in trees, the method, there's one method, you cut and ship the host trees. And that's what, what is done. And so they, instead of just having a bunch of maple trees fall down and lie, they're all completely removed, chipped, and mostly even the chips are removed. So in some ways, it's a more dramatic effect. Um, however, it, it has been effective in some locations. Certainly, um, we wouldn't want this insect to get out of control and continue to to spread to all parts of the landscape. So in this case, um, host removal is a good choice as long as it continues to be in isolated pockets. And we need to look no further really than the 1938 hurricane, even though it wasn't a pest event, you know, a very dramatic disturbance that affected much of southern New England also then became one of the most intensive salvage operations that existed. These are all wind-thrown trees and, and mounds that would have had long stems attached to them and would have provided a bunch of slash and branches that then were all cut. And so this ended up being a much more dramatic disturbance. And so I'm using that kind of as an analogy to think about if we have an, a, you know, a large area that could killed off by an insect, we don't always have to go and, and cut them all down. There are good reasons and good situations where we should do so, but in many cases, kind of letting it go might be the more prudent thing to do. And of course, um, but, but where there are good uh, opportunities to either direct succe succession or to kind of change how you want that forest to be, or if you have um, safety or aesthetic concerns, there's a range of cutting options that you can do for a variety of these pests, including do nothing, as I've tried to state a couple of times, that's certainly a viable option. Um, for places l like um, black ash or green ash areas, uh, if they're high ash dominated forests, you might want to reduce the intensity a little bit. There's a feeling that you could slow the spread. Ultimately, you know, I don't know if that'll work or not, but that's being touted and thrown out there. Um, you can take another example of, let's say, a hemlock hardwood mixture that you know the hemlocks are dying off, they're not going to make it. If you wanted to kind of speed up that transition to hardwood forest, you could cut out uh, the hemlocks in, in small or, or large groups and kind of speed that up. And of course, these are all based on whatever decisions and objectives you have as a manager or landowner. And there are a variety of reasons why you, and to uh, consider safety, aesthetics, financial return, how you want it to look, do you care? Um, do you have cars that these dead trees could fall on, things of that nature, all play into those um, responses. And of course, if, you know, many times people want for example, of hemlock, you want um, conifers back. You want an evergreen component maybe in your landscape. And so um, that in many cases will involve planting. You're gonna have to plant conifers if you don't have seed trees nearby. And so you're just gonna need to be careful about what you plant there, A, to see if it will even work, not get out competed by other things. And of course, you wanna diversify those species as we've seen in a few of those examples. You don't want a monoculture of everything uh, into the future to get ready for the next pest. And so, um, to conclude, certainly the pests and pathogens uh, continue to influence forests, uh, shape the structure and composition of, of our forests. Um, I think one of the, the, the amazing lessons that we see is that forests can recover uh, under many different circumstances, and they can occur and recover very rapidly. Oftentimes, uh, it might be a slightly different or even more dramatic change in composition, but it does become a forest again. And, uh, sometimes leading to novel assemblages, species that co-occur that weren't normally occurring in the past. 
Uh, an example of that would be, you know, a, a lanthus or tree of heaven growing in an area that used to be hemlock, uh, an invasive tree that finds these niches and can take advantage of them. Chemical treatments, by, by and away, are very effective for localized tree um, protection via a, a number of different methods. However, it's just not practical uh, in terms of application or finances to protect at large scales. The biocontrol options, um, uh, in my opinion, just have not been very effective. And it doesn't mean I'm down completely on biocontrol, but so far, um, some of these insects are, are really good examples of how they're just not well suited for biocontrol efforts. They, they reproduce and spread rapidly. So those are pretty hard to get at in terms of a biocontrol. And of course, there's always questions about the non-target impacts from a biocontrol agent. Uh, and oftentimes, you know, despite our best efforts, the pest dynamics really uh, unfold uh, despite our choice. And so we need to think carefully about how we want to tinker and, and reshape the landscape. Because in, in, in some cases, our, you know, efforts may, uh, may make the situation even worse. You, you can think of a wetland area that has a lot of black ash in that you feel like you need to go salvage. Well, that damage in of its, or that uh, disturbance by cutting would make a bad situation even worse. And so we need to be cautious for um, that knee-jerk reaction that we have to salvage everything that dies out there. Uh, it is warranted in some cases, but in many cases it's not. And of course, the, the final take-home are, are pretty straightforward, but it, I can show you good examples today of why early detection is really critical for some of these insects. Um, six trees versus 30,000 trees it really is a great example. And of course, this is why uh, the fact that so many of these um, insects, including the ones I didn't discuss today, have larvae that are contained in wood that can be moved around really easily in firewood from state to state. You now, if they can spend a year or two in a wood uh, pallet, they can certainly crawl out and, and influence another forest even a year from now. And just to close, uh, we certainly see that, you know, uh, pests and pathogens have had a historical influence, as David has shown. It's becoming a much more frequent disturbance in our forests and will continue to do so in the future. And this slide kind of hits home this fact that we have a hemlock tree that's infested with hemlock woolly adelgid next to a beech tree uh, infested with beech bark disease next to a chestnut stump that was cut by, um, uh, by the, you know, eventually cut down as an influence by the chestnut blight. And so even in this 10 foot square area, we have three successive generations of trees that are being influenced by different pests, and yet it's still largely an intact forest. Um, but as each one of these pests comes in, it does change the nature of our forests. And so with that, I just want to thank um, the various funding sources that have influenced um, our, our work over the years, Harvard Forest, the Forest Service, you know, National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, Smithsonian, and the Arnold Arboretum. And of course, the dozen of, of undergraduate students have really helped me formulate a lot of this work. I didn't show a lot of data today, but I, I assure you that these studies are backed up with a lot of data, and many of these uh, data were collected by undergraduates. And this is a picture of a Harvard undergraduate freshman seminar class, which I also encourage if any of those students are in the um, building tonight to consider that uh, in the winter. And with that, I think that Peter will you, moderate. Peter. So we do have time for questions. We've got about 15 minutes for questions. And I'll just sort of um, start by asking um, either of the two Davids. Um, forestry is, uh, you know, is not an exact science by any stretch of the imagination. But uh, when I worked at the Harvard Forest in the 1970s, there were all sorts of models out there about forest growth and development. And you know, one of the things that's interesting is that with the hemlock woolly adelgid taken out of the uh, picture by the, you know, uh, the hemlock taken out of the uh, picture by the adelgid, the black birch, Betula lenta, is the species that okay. has replaced it, which I don't think anybody really predicted. There's no model that predicts it. So my question for you is, now with the ash taken out by the uh, emerald ash borer, and we now have areas where it's been gone for like 10 years, you know, what is you, you know, are there any models that predict, you know, what species is going to fill the gap <coughs> left by, you know, I know with the, when the chestnut disappeared, a lot of oak species moved in to fill that niche. But, you know, what does the sort of the, the modeling of forest behavior say about what species are going to increase in response to these uh, pressures? 
Right. I mean, I could, I could take a stab and feel free to add. I mean, certainly a lot of it depends on the type of habitat that it's, it is being influenced by these pests. For the ash, depending whether it's white ash or, or black ash, a more wetland species, you're going to be more confined to wetland type species, shade tolerant species that will probably do fairly well in those environments. So a model there would be other things, perhaps other maple or other shade tolerant species, probably red maple in, in those situations. You know, in terms of uh, hemlock or, or other pests, but, but particularly hemlock, the black birch, I think, is more a phenomenon of the fact that it's, it's regionally increased over the last century, so it's well poised to take not advantage not only of the woolly adults, but any other type of disturbance. You have a wind disturbance now, black birch is there. You have a cutting operation, black birch is there. It's the first one in. And so it, it's a regional increase. And so you're right, there's no models that would predict that, predict that per se, but it's based on what's already growing there and that it can come into those sites. And then 